Hello everyone, welcome to Future Cities Lab podcast. Here in Singapore, I'm your host, Andrew Stokels. We hear a lot of exciting predictions related to autonomous vehicles that they will transform the way cities are built by efficiently utilizing road space and help reduce the need for streets or even funnel more traffic along existing streets. We see images of people sleeping or eating in cars, teleconferencing in their vehicle on the way to work. Some of these images actually date to the 1950s. It looks very futuristic and exciting, but it's also an example of what we would call techno-utopianism, a naive expectation that autonomous vehicles will solve all of our urban problems, particularly traffic. Recently here in Singapore, the first autonomous bus began running at Nanyang Technological University, NTU. The bus ferries students around the campus, and it's one of the first instances of autonomous vehicles operating, especially here in Singapore, which is being very proactive about the technology. Today, we will be speaking with Tanvi Maheshwari. Tanvi is an urban designer and PhD student at Future Cities Laboratory, and is researching the implications of autonomous vehicles for how cities will be designed in the future. So Tanvi, um, could you tell us a little bit more about what the potential benefits, but also the challenges are with autonomous vehicles? The potential benefits and challenges of autonomous vehicles is a subject of great interest to me uh, because it is the uncertainty surrounding autonomous vehicles is tremendous. Uh, on the one hand, like you said, we can save a lot of space, the vehicles can run more efficiently. It saves people a lot of time because they can conduct a lot of activities inside the vehicle. At the same time, uh, a vehicle that's so comfortable or that picks you up from home and parks itself may mean that it becomes more attractive as a mode of transport, leading to something that we call induced demand, uh, leading people to travel a lot more uh, longer distances and longer hours. So we are not really sure currently as to is it really a benefit to our city, is it solving all of our problems? Um, it would, it might be a question of the kind of regulatory fr regulatory framework that we are operating in and the urban context that we're working within. Right. So uh, in the U.S., for example, induced demand has been discussed by transportation planning experts, historians of planning, that um, when you build highways or build extra lanes in highways, it actually stimulates more people to drive. So adding more capacity doesn't necessarily uh, improve traffic in the long run. It actually just stimulates people to drive. Now, does that depend at all on the context in terms of how autonomous vehicles are used? Yes, uh, the example of the U.S. is uh, a good one because in the U.S. car-oriented development has been the norm for a long time. And what they're doing there is trying to use the autonomous vehicle to uh, solve some of the problems that we created by cre uh, that the car created. So that means using the AV to revitalize some of these far-flung suburban areas that are not well connected to uh, more activities and uh, uh, more commercial uses. Uh, in Singapore, autonomous vehicles are tackling a totally different problem. What we are struggling with here is the high density and the lack of space. Uh, we want to use autonomous vehicles to drastically save up on the transportation infrastructure, uh, the space required for transportation infrastructure in the city. Currently, we use about 12% of our land for this, and we are a land scarce island. So uh, autonomous vehicles could potentially uh, drive much more efficiently and save space. At the same time, autonomous vehicles can be used to promote more shared mobility, car sharing, ride sharing. And in that case, we can even more drastically reduce the amount of space required. So the management model would actually be different uh, with this kind of autonomous vehicle setup, right? Yes. Uh, depending on the regulatory and urban context, it's totally different impacts. And you mentioned the space. So autonomous vehicles will actually impact design um, and the way cities are designed. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, it works both ways. Autonomous uh, vehicles will impact uh, the urban form and our uh, urban environment. At the same time, how we design our urban environment will impact how autonomous vehicles will be used in the future. Because the autonomous vehicle could be a private car, uh, it could be a shared Uber vehicle, it could be a bus like the one running in NTU that you were talking about. So the autonomous vehicle is a technology, but how we're going to implement it as a mobility system is a matter of planning and design. Uh, so, for example, if I design a much more uh, walkable neighborhood 
uh, we, we can expect people to walk more. Just like if I design a six lane highway, we can expect congestion on the six, six lane highway. Uh, so urban design and planning plays a key role in uh, pushing uh, the autonomous vehicle benefits or uh, dangers either way. So also putting autonomous vehicles without changing anything about the urban design context might also not deliver any of the expected benefits, right? Yes, if you do not do it with intent, uh, there can be many unintended consequences. So um, what kind of tools do we need to evaluate how uh, urban design should accommodate autonomous vehicles? The tools has been a very tricky problem for us um, because so far in urban design and transport planning, what we use something called the predict and provide model, which means that we, cre we look at the current travel behavior and uh, transport infrastructure provision, and then we predict what would be needed uh, in the future and what kind of uh, transport flows would be generated in a certain future, and then we provide infrastructure for it. Now, this model is getting increasingly obsolete for several reasons. One of the main reasons is the great uncertainty now in the transportation sector. Things are changing so quickly that it's very hard to make these predictions. Also, these predictions are based on the fact that human behavior and the travel behavior would remain the same in the future. You're extrapolating current behavior, which is not entirely true. We know that um, through policy and design, we can influence people's travel behavior. And finally, uh, these kind of models also require an immense amount of data on the current travel behavior. You have to understand the current travel patterns in a lot of detail to be able to predict future travel patterns. And um, things are changing so quickly that it's very hard to create these detailed simulations on the go. Uh, to solve all of these problems here in the lab, we are trying to develop an agile, quick iterative simulation tool that can give an urban design a designer a quick feedback on the design move they're making. So if I design a certain type of neighborhood with a land use mix of a certain percentage and network uh, topology, what kind of urban flows, transportation flows is it generating? Uh, where is the congestion? How many kilometers are being traveled? Where are the delays? I could get a rough, broad feedback on this question. And from some of these simulations that you've been running, what are some of the findings? What have you seen about what types of neighborhoods or even design features uh, contribute to or affect how people use autonomous vehicles? We, we have been running some very preliminary uh, simulations on a test uh, residential site. And one of the first findings that uh, we had from our results was uh, all this optimism about autonomous vehicles is um, unfounded because the real benefit comes from vehicle sharing and not so much the autonomous autonomousness of okay. uh, the vehicle, right. the automation. Uh, so the real benefit comes from the automation, not from the automation, but the sharing. Uh, so when we run this simulation, we realize that when all the vehicles are automated, they run very uh, much more efficiently, closely together, and then we can sp save about 20% lane space of the roads. But if all vehicles are shared, there's no private car ownership, you can get a private taxi, uh, or you can share it like a grab pool, grab share or Uber pool. In that case, you can save 40% of the road space. So that's the real gain that we are so some, some of this space might be reallocated for pedestrians, for parks, these kind of things. Is that something that's feasible uh, in an already built out urban context? Yes, definitely. Uh, already built out urban context it can be adapted. And at the same time, this means that every new development that we are building out today should take into consideration the fact that the road, use of the road space might drastically change in the future. Uh, the other aspect is also the parking that we are looking at. The nature of parking will change entirely because right. if we can, if we see a car that parks itself, which requires much less space than a human-driven car. Uh, but then again, there the benefits of sharing far outweigh the benefits of uh, automation, because um, if we look at a neighborhood uh, in our test neighborhood, the current parking norms require about twenty thousand parking spaces. And this is in Singapore. In Singapore, yeah. a residential neighborhood. For this test experiment that we designed, we required about 20,000 car spaces given Singapore's parking norms. While if we have no private cars and everyone is served by a shared transportation system, we require only 1,000 vehicles. So that's, again, a very large gain uh, 
And I feel like this is a fascinating kind of a new angle to autonomous vehicles because uh, at least in the U.S. and other contexts, the conversation doesn't really seem to be focusing much on the implications for design of cities. It's mostly on what sorts of technologies are coming and what sorts of companies are going to be taking advantage of these technologies, like ride sharing. Uh, but I think this is a, a really important aspect to, to be thinking about. And, and it sounds a lot like cities have to really proactively plan and uh, envision how they want to develop in the future before they can think about um, what kind of autonomous vehicles or even if they want autonomous vehicles. Yes, uh, automation is a great technology uh, that can be supplemented with uh, vehicle sharing, electrification, and many other new de technological developments in transportation. But the goal is not how do we accommodate the automated vehicles within our city. The question is how, what kind of future mobility goals do we have as a city? And then once we know what our goals are, and we can start discussing the technologies that enable us to reach those goals. So for in Singapore, uh, just to use an example, what would be some of the goals uh, that Singapore is looking to uh, solve right now in terms of their transportation? Uh, one of the key goals that I talked about before was uh, space efficiency. Uh, but there's also an important goal uh, with regards to active mobility. Uh, Singapore has an aging population and health and active mobility is a large part of Singapore transportation agenda. So while we do want to enable uh, autonomous vehicles for its space benefits. At the same time, we want to make sure it doesn't threaten walking or cycling as a mode of uh, transportation. So Tanvi, you mentioned that uh, urban design is very important and you've been testing through these simulations different configurations of neighborhoods and urban design and seeing how that actually affects the demand for autonomous vehicles and other modes. So what are the sorts of things from the urban designer's standpoint that actually uh, are going to be really important when you think about the future city, the future neighborhood, and particularly in Singapore where you have a history of uh, very well-developed neighborhoods. Yeah, uh, in terms of urban design, there are two important problems to tackle. One, uh, how do we retrofit the existing uh, infrastructure? And the second is how can we imagine a new, if, if you're building something from scratch for tomorrow, what could it be like? For the existing infrastructure, what we can imagine is uh, in the best case scenario, to start slowly reclaiming space from all the machines on our streets and giving them back to the people. So I can imagine that uh, over time, first, as it, we have more autonomous vehicles, uh, as they drive more efficiently, we might require narrower lanes, uh, but we might even be able to do away with the whole lane. And this extra road space could then be used to create a more generous cycling infrastructure and walking infrastructure. Uh, the other aspect of uh, the autonomous story is also the shared mobility story. So we can imagine uh, the total end of car ownership, private car ownership, in which case you always access your personal car uh, transportation through some sort of pickup or drop off point like we have today. But imagine the entire neighborhood is using these pickup and drop off points. So these could become very important centers of activity. Well, in the worst case scenario, everybody gets a car to drop them off and pick them up right from their doorstep, uh, which would lead to a lot more kilometers traveled and more congestion maybe even. But uh, we could also imagine these kind of large mobility hubs where people gather, uh, where they reach through very walkable, uh, uh, walking friendly neighborhoods, and they reach these mobility hubs to access these shared vehicles, which are also uh, which also have commercial activities and it's a moment for people to interact with each other and create more life on the street. Uh, in terms of designing a new neighborhoods, the question of the network design and topology becomes very interesting. If you want to facilitate more shared rides, you know, more vehicles uh, to pool people in, we need to create more connected networks and grid networks. In our simulation, we tested out more uh, super grid kind of networks that we have in Singapore where you have right. a large grid and then drop off and pick up through This is an in. enclosed kind of neighborhood. Exactly. Uh, and we, versus a more connected grid like neighborhood. So let's say a Manhattan or mm -hmm. a, even a Barcelona. Uh, what we see is that in a more connected neighborhood, while we do require slightly more road space, because we're using, uh, we have more roads in general, mm -hmm. uh, there is more efficient usage of shared vehicles. Rides are pulled more, um, pull better, and vehicles have to travel less. 
uh, how it, and you also need less vehicles to serve the entire neighborhood. Right. But when you have these kind of large super blocks with only drop off pickup points, you might have uh, uh, you might need f- fewer um, uh, um, less. You might need fewer roads and less road space. Okay. But the overall uh, vehicle kilometers driven are tremendous, and you don't have as much vehicle sharing. So you just go back to something you said about uh, not needing lanes in the future. That sounds like quite a radical uh, change, uh, the end of lanes. What would that look like on a street where you have autonomous vehicles, cyclists, pedestrians? Are you imagining a more integrated um, setup, or would there still be a need to separate out modes? I think there would be both. Uh, Like we have today, we have an MRT to connect us at fast speed, connect large volume of people on longer distances. Uh, while we also have something called park connectors in Singapore, which is a more leisurely experience. So we would always require something of both. So uh, if you look at the Singapore's vision for future of autonomous vehicles, you see a very layered kind of structure. Where right at the bottom, which is underground, you have fast logistic delivery in autonomous vehicles um, separated from the ground level. At the ground level, then you have kind of this open plain where pedestrians and cyclists and small, quieter electric autonomous vehicles move together in a shared space. So that we would need a combination of both to efficiently run our city. Well, that's fascinating. Uh, Thank you so much, Tanvi, for this uh, look into the future. Uh, Singapore is doing a lot, and Future Cities Lab is positioned here, studying what's going on here to help plan for the future of cities. So it's a very exciting time. Thank you very much for sharing these insights. Thank you, Andrew.